Admittance is a uh, complex quantity, so we can define a admittance plane, a complex admittance plane, uh, just the same as we did for a complex impedance plane. In this case, the horizontal axis, the real axis, now would be the axis that defined the direction of increasing conductance as opposed to increasing resistance in the case of impedance. Likewise, the vertical axis is the imaginary axis, the imaginary part of admittance being susceptance, the axis in this case then and describes the direction of increasing susceptance as opposed to reactance as it was um, for the case of impedance. Otherwise, we can do the same things on the complex admittance plane that we could on the complex impedance plane. We can go through and pot plot specific points um, uh, on the complex admittance plane that correspond to specific values of admittance. Admittance of a real part of 120 and imaginary part of minus 60 would uh, plot to a specific location on this complex gamma plane. Moreover, we could define contours of constant uh, conductance or susceptance, just as we did for the complex impedance plane. The vertical scale, or the vertical contour I show here, is a contour of uh, G equal to 75, meaning all of the points on the complex admittance plane that correspond to admittance whose real part is equal to 75. What about the imaginary part? What about the susceptance? Well, as we move up and down this contour, we'll encounter different points. The real part will be 75, but their imaginary part will change. The susceptance will change. At one point, as we cross the horizontal axis, the susceptance, of course, would be equal to zero. The important thing here is, though, as we increase along this contour all the way up to infinity, we find the susceptance goes to plus infinity. Likewise, as we move down the contour, we reach a point that is approaching minus infinity. What happens at this, uh, these points? If we have a susceptance that goes to plus or minus infinity, then the magnitude of the admittance must likewise be approaching infinity, an infinite admittance. What does infinite admittance mean? Well, infinite admittance <coughs> is the same thing as zero impedance. In other words, it's the same thing as a short circuit. As we move along these contours to plus infinity and minus infinity, we approach a short circuit case where the admittance goes to infinity. Very similar to what we did for the complex impedance plane, but there, as our contours approached infinity, as we moved away from the origin of the uh, complex plane and to a point that had a magnitude of infinity, we approached a uh, uh, impedance, again, of infinity and therefore an open circuit. We found with the complex impedance plane, all contours led to an open circuit point. In the complex admittance plane, we find all contours will um, lead to a, uh, uh, a short circuit point. And the same thing, therefore, for this horizontal contour. B is equal to minus 30. Every point on this red contour corresponds to an admittance whose imaginary part is minus 30. Over here, the conductance is positive. Over here, the conductance would be negative. Right here, the conductance would be zero, a uh, admittance of, uh, of purely imaginary value of minus 30. As we move outward toward the right, toward infinity, the conductance in this case would increase to infinity. And if the conductance increases to infinity, then the magnitude of the admittance will be infinite as well. In other words, we approach a short circuit. If we go the other direction, we find the conductance will go to minus infinity. Again, the magnitude of the resulting admittance will be infinity. The admittance is infinite, and therefore we have a short circuit, a device, uh, uh, an element with uh, uh, zero um, um, impedance is one with infinite admittance. Now, we ask ourselves, can we map these points and contours on the complex gamma plane? We took all of our contours, our Cartesian contours, on the complex impedance plane, and we mapped them onto the complex gamma plane. And of course, this formed the contours of the Smith chart. The question we ask ourselves in this case, can we do the same thing with contours of con constant uh, conductance and contours of constant susceptance. To see how we would map uh, points on the complex admittance plane onto the uh, uh, complex gamma plane, let's first go back and think about how we map 
uh, values of complex impedance to the complex gamma plane. So in this case, we'll talk about a normalized uh, impedance, uh, impedance divided by Z zero. And let's pick a point at random. Let's say it has a real part of one and an imaginary part of one. And of course, on the complex impedance plane, we, if we have a contour, which is a contour of constant uh, reactance of one and a vertical contour, a contour of constant resistance of one, we find that the intersection of those two contours is our impedance um, that is uh, provided here, a value of one plus j. And let's see where that value would plot to onto the complex gamma plane. So with the Smith chart, this mapping from the complex impedance plane to the complex gamma plane is very simple. We go through and we find our R equal to one contour, which was a vertical contour on the complex impedance plane. Now it's mapped to a circle on the complex gamma plane. And we find the X equal to one contour, once a horizontal contour on the complex impedance plane now has mapped into a uh, uh, contour uh, in the upper half of the uh, uh, complex gamma plane on our Smith chart. And once again, at the intersection of those two points, we find that the proper location on the complex gamma plane for that original impedance of one plus J one. We know we're at the right location. To find the value of gamma 1, we could go through and measure the distance from the origin out to that point using the radius to the unit circle as a, uh, a normalizing value or distance of 1, and then likewise find the rotation angle using the outer scale to find the value of gamma 1 if we were interested in that value. Or we could simply go through and calculate it, and what we find in either case, this is the result. I'll express it in real and imaginary, gamma 1 for this this uh, original uh, impedance of 1 plus j uh, is going to be uh, 0.2 plus j 0.2. So this mapping from the complex impedance plane onto the complex gamma plane is something certainly we've done before. We understand that now with the Smith chart. The question we are asking, of course, is not how does the impedance map onto the complex gamma plane, but how does a point on the complex emittance plane map onto the complex gamma plane? Well, let's do this. Let's take our value that we had, Z1 is 1 plus J, and express it not in terms of its impedance, but in terms of its admittance, or more specifically, its normalized admittance. We simply take the geometric inverse of that value, and if we do the math, we get a value of 0.5 minus J.5, a real part of 1 half, an imaginary part of minus 1 half. Where would that be on the complex um, uh, admittance plane? Well, we find it would be at this location, at the intersection of a constant susceptance of minus 0.5 and a constant conductance of 0.5 is the admittance we'll call uh, Y1, which is simply, again, the inverse of 1 plus J. It's that same impedance now expressed in terms of its admittance. Now, if we look at this, we're in a different location in the uh, complex admittance plane than we were on the complex impedance plane. From a standpoint of Cartesian coordinates, on the complex impedance plane, we're at uh, a one, uh, you know, an x value of one and a y value of one. Here, we're at an x value of one half and a y value of minus one half. We're at different locations. And so, does this point, this admittance map to a different location on the complex gamma plane? So we know the reflection coefficient uh, is related to the uh, admittance of a uh, quantity uh, with, uh, in this form. We provided that uh, earlier, and we notice it has the same uh, mathematical form as with uh, normalized impedance with the exception of a minus one out front. So we go through and we do this math, and we get a value here for the reflection coefficient uh, that results from this admittance. And notice we get exactly the same value that we got when we use the impedance value to determine the reflection coefficient. Uh, 0.2 plus j, actually it's 0.4, I think I said 0.2 before, 0.4j. It's the same location. And this is a very important concept to understand that even though we can take a quantity, a load impedance or a input impedance, and express it in a certain way, and then we take the inverse to express that same physical thing in terms of its admittance, however we express it, it maps to the same value of gamma. There's only one ga value of gamma for uh, a load, regardless of whether we talk about it in terms of its admittance or its impedance. 
So this is, again, a very uh, important point and sometimes a point that students uh, uh, will um, uh, struggle with is even though uh, we take, let's say, an input impedance and we write it in terms of its admittance value and plot it on the complex admittance plane and set a certain point. If we take that same input admittance and express it again in terms of its input impedance, for example, it will have a different complex number and it will therefore be on a different point on the complex impedance plane. But but if we take either of those values and calculate the resulting gamma, we would get the same value of gamma, the same location on the complex impedance plane. And so if we're talking about a quantity, uh, again, a load, let's say, or an input, um, we can talk about it in terms of its emittance or equivalently in terms of its impedance or equivalently in terms of its reflection coefficient. There isn't a reflection coefficient associated with the impedance and a different one for the admittance. Both of these will have the same reflection coefficient representation, three different ways of expressing precisely the same thing. So we could take a, an impedance value and take the geometric inverse to uh, convert it into impedance and then plot that impedance onto the complex gamma plane using a Smith chart. Certainly that would work. But we really want more insight into how an emittance value would map directly onto the complex gamma plane. Do we have to go through and take the detour of converting emittance into impedance before we convert impedance into reflection coefficient? Can we more directly go from emittance value to a reflection coefficient value, an emittance point onto the complex gamma plane? Well, it turns out we can. And to see how that works, let's consider uh, this situation. Let's just say, let's have um, a, a situation now that we're considering where we have a value we'll call y2, which is equal to 1 plus j. Now notice, numerically, that's exactly the same value as our original impedance that we considered. We were mapping an impedance value with a real part of 1, an imaginary part of 1, onto the complex gamma plane. Now we're going to go through and plot an emittance with the same numeric value. Now these are different things. They have the same numeric value. If I invert the value of impedance, 1 plus j, I get a different value, obviously, than this admittance value of 1 plus j. They're different things. For example, to see this, let's say we take an open circuit. An open circuit has a magnitude of impedance, which is equal to infinity. It's infinitely large. But an open circuit, likewise, has an admittance which is equal to zero. The same thing in open circuit. In admittance, we say it has a value of zero. <clears throat> in, um, uh, in impedance, we say it has a value of infinity. For short circuit, the uh, uh, admittance is equal to infinity and the impedance is equal to zero. So if I had a device, if I had a situation rather, where let's say the susceptance of a device was zero, and the impedance of a different device were zero, clearly they'd be different devices. If the susceptance, I'm sorry, the admittance rather, of a device is equal to zero, then it's an open circuit. And if the impedance of a device is equal to zero, then that is a short circuit. They're different things, even though they numerically have the same value in that case, and admittance and impedance equal to zero, but very different things. And so I want to keep that in mind. So this is numerically equal to this, but it clearly is a different thing, uh, even though they have the same numerical value. Let's see if we can plot where this point is on the complex gamma plane. All right, so what we're going to do to uh, determine this location on the complex gamma plane is use our relationship between admittance and reflection coefficient. We simply insert the value of the admittance that we are uh, considering in this case, 1 plus j, and we find that we get a reflection coefficient of minus 0.2 minus j 0.4. Now there's a sense of deja vu there, isn't it? I think I've seen this number before. What we find is this reflection coefficient uh, that we get for this admittance it maps on to location whose value is exactly the opposite of the reflection coefficient uh, we had for an impedance, which likewise had the same numeric value of 1 plus j. For an impedance normalized of 1 plus j, we map to this location on the complex gamma plane, 0.2 plus j, 0.4. 
for the admittance with the same numeric value, different different thing, different kind, but the same numeric value of one plus j, it maps onto the complex gamma plane at a value which is equal to gamma one times minus one. And of course, times minus one means we're multiplying by e to the j pi. We are shifting the phase of that complex number by a value of pi radians or 180 degrees. So what we're saying is if I take an emittance of some value and plot it onto the, uh, I'm sorry, the impedance of some value and plot it onto the complex gamma plane, and then I take an emittance of the same numeric value, it must be a different thing, but has the same numeric value, and I plot it onto the complex gamma plane, what we find is the two locations on the complex gamma plane, one for the impedance and the other for the emittance of the same numeric value, those results are going to be uh, uh, similar, uh, not the same same but similar uh, in that they will have um, uh, the two are be related by a minus sign, the opposite, a phase shift of pi radians. And the question is that just a coincidence that this occurred for this particular case or is it more uh, a more general result? And the answer is it is a more general result. We can see it's a more general result when we look at the relationship between the reflection coefficient and the normalized impedance and the reflection coefficient and the normalized emittance. The only difference in the mathematical form between these two is this minus one out front for the relationship of the re uh, reflection coefficient to normalize admittance. We can write that minus one, of course, is e to the j pi, since we're talking about complex values here, and see it's really this coefficient out front that is the difference. Mathematically, numerically, it has the same form, and therefore if z prime and y prime have the same value, we will get the same result with the exception of this minus sign or e to the j pi uh, associated with it. So the two have the same mathematical form to within a multiplier of minus one. So again, if we have a, an, a value of impedance that is numerically equal to a value of emittance, the resultant reflection coefficient values will be related uh, with this in this way, uh, uh, the difference simply being a factor of e to the j pi, a value of minus one. Let's look or think about what that means, either j pi, that is again a phase shift of pi radians or 180 degrees. Graphically, then we can say that this relationship means that the two values of gamma one and gamma two are related on the complex gamma plane in that each is exactly 180 degrees on the other side of the Smith or the complex gamma plane with respect to the other. We simply rotate around 180 degrees from one to get to the other, keeping the same distance, the same magnitude uh, as we rotate. So let's look at that graphically. So this is a, a graphical um, a representation of what uh, I just stated. Uh, we look at the complex gamma plane, in this case the Smith chart, and we plot the value of gamma 1, and the value of gamma 2 then is simply a 180 ro degrees rotation around the center of the, of the Smith chart, around the center of the complex gamma plane, till we get to the other point. Notice the magnitude of gamma 1 and gamma 2 have the same value, so they're same distance from the origin in either case. The phase, though, is 180 degrees, and so again we can just rotate with a circular arc uh, over from one point uh, over to uh, the other. And again, we see we can write this mathematically likewise as a factor of minus one, the uh, opposite of both the uh, imaginary and real part um, for the value of gamma. So here's a way then of plotting um, the value of some emittance onto the complex gamma plane if we have a Smith chart. We first determine the value of an impedance with precisely the same numeric value as that of the emittance. And we use then the contours of constant impedance to locate that place on the complex gamma plane. Of course, it's in the wrong location uh, because uh, uh, an impedance of the same numeric value as an emittance is a different thing. Again, they should be inversely related. Still, we find the point on the complex gamma plane on the Smith chart uh, for the impedance that has the same numeric value, 1 plus J1 in our example. And then once we find that location, then we draw a line uh, through the Smith chart uh, through the origin 
and then we take our compass and we rotate around 180 degrees and we stop when we get to that line. And then we know we are in the right location on the complex gamma plane that corresponds to the admittance uh, that we were um, uh, trying to evaluate. So in this way, we didn't have to go through and explicitly convert our admittance into an impedance. Uh, we didn't have to specifically find the value of gamma. We simply use the constant uh, impedance contours, resistance and reactance, to find a location for an impedance that had the same numeric value. Again, not the inverse of the admittance, simply a an impedance that had the same numeric value, 1 plus j. And then we rotate it around 180 degrees to find the lo proper location on the complex gamma plane for an admittance, which has the, that value of 1 plus j in our example. Of course, this is true for any admittance that uh, that we might want to do. If we had uh, an admittance of uh, 2 uh, uh, plus uh, 0.5 j, we'd find the proper location for the impedance and then again rotate around 180 degrees to find the proper location on the gamma plane for that specific admittance. All right, given this, that the rotation around 180 degrees puts us at the right spot on the uh, on the Smith chart, let's think about how we might map entire contours of constant conductance or constant susceptance onto the complex gamma plane. So for example, let's say we talk about all of the admittance values that have a real part of two, have a conductance of two. On the complex admittance plane, the normalized admittance plane, we would see that that would have a vertical contour. And again, it would extend all the way up to plus infinity and minus infinity outward to those short circuit points in this case. How would that contour map onto the constant, um, uh, I'm sorry, how would that contour map onto the reflection coefficient, the complex gamma plane? So it turns out we can use the uh, contours on our Smith chart for constant impedance, uh, resistance, or reactance. We can use that, those same contours to easily determine the corresponding contours of constant conductance and con uh, constant susceptance. We can come up with a new set of contours uh, on the complex gamma plane associated with constant G and, and constant S. Um, but, um, uh, or I'm sorry, constant B rather, um, but we can do that actually relatively easily and simply by taking our original contour, contours uh, on the complex uh, gamma plane uh, that came from the uh, complex impedance plane. So let's see how we might do that. So again, let's consider a case where we have a contour on the complex admittance plane whose real part is equal to, uh, normalized real part is equal to two. The normalized conductance is equal to two, and that has a vertical contour. On the complex impedance plane, there would likewise be a contour whose real part had a value equal to two. Every point on that contour had a real value of two, the imaginary part going from minus infinity to zero to plus infinity. And so we have a similar mathematical artifact, the contour whose real part is equal to two, both on the complex impedance plane and on the complex admittance plane. Now we know how this contour on the complex impedance plane maps onto a circle uh, contour on the complex gamma plane. The uh, Smith chart provides us with those mapping so the question is, where does this uh, contour of, con of constant conductance map to on the complex gamma plane? Well, remember, we have a situation numerically here for any point on this uh, vertical um, contour, r equal to 2 contour, there is a, you take a point and there's a certain reactance associated with it that corresponds to a point on the constant uh, conductance plane of 2. Uh, uh, that has a numeric value that is exactly the same. If this point has a reactive value of one, then this point would correspond to a real part of two and imaginary part of one. There is some location on this contour that has a real part of two and likewise has an imaginary part of one. In this case, of course, that would be the susceptance had imaginary part of equal to one. And so there is a, for every point on this contour, a 
point on another contour that has numerically the same value. And remember, if we ha we know that if they are numerically have the same value in terms of impedance and admittance, that the location on the complex gamma plane, when we map, are exactly 180 degrees out of phase, or uh, rotation phase, around the Smith chart from each other. So again, this points out that statement graphically. Um, for a given point on the complex gamma plane for impedance, if I want to find the proper location of the complex gamma plane for an admittance of the same numeric value, we simply rotate around the Smith chart, the complex gamma plane, 180 degrees. Now think about this. We know where the contour r equal to 2 maps onto the Smith chart, all right, to be somewhere right around here there, and we know every point on that contour has a corresponding value of admittance uh, that has a real part of 2, the conductance for 2. And so to find all of those points whose conductance are equal to 2, not the resistance, is we take each and every point on this contour and we rotate it around 180 degrees on the Smith chart. If we take every point on that circle and rotate it around 180 degrees, we are in fact rotating that entire circle. And what we find then is the contour of constant conductance on our complex gamma plane. So that's shown here. We have our um, start out with a vertical contour on the complex impedance plane, r equal to, the real part is equal to 2, and then we map it to a circular contour on the complex gamma plane, map all those points onto the complex gamma plane, that's our contour on our Smith chart there. If I want to come up with the uh, equivalent contour for g is equal to 2, the real points on the complex uh, um, uh, emittance plane are equal to do, are equal to 2, then we simply take the circle and rotate around 180 degrees on the Smith chart. And that's what we're doing here. We rotate the blue circle around 180 degrees, and now we have the contour of constant uh, conductance of 2 on our complex gamma plane. As we move around the circle, we find that this is the location of every admittance whose real part is equal to 2 as we plot it onto the gamma plane, as the react or susceptance, I should say here, goes from minus infinity to 0 to plus infinity. And so that whole vertical contour now maps now onto a different circle here on the left side of our complex gamma plane. So uh, notice something uh, interesting here that makes perfect sense. Remember, we start with the vertical contour of the complex impedance plane. When that vertical contour crossed uh, the real axis, that is when the susceptance was equal to zero. But as we went upward and downward, that uh, reactance increased to infinity. And at the ends, at the ends of those uh, uh, vertical contours, remember, were the open circuit point, which is mean, which was why when we plotted onto the complex gamma plane, now we plotted onto a circle such that the endpoints had to converge to the open circuit. All right, so it converged there. Now in this case for constant uh, conductance as we move upward and downward along the contour we approach a susceptance that goes to infinity and therefore the admittance <clears throat> then we'll go to infinity. But an emittance of infinity corresponds to a short circuit. And that's what happened in this case. We take the on the complex emittance plane or contour, uh, vertical contour that goes upward and downward to infinity, and we plop onto the complex gamma plane. Now it plots onto a circle that whose ends now converge to the short circuit point. This Location here is the mapping of an emittance whose real part is equal to 2 and whose imaginary part is equal to 0, 0 susceptance, a purely real admittance. As we move this direction, we will find that the susceptance will become more and more negative until it approaches an infinite uh, value and therefore approaches the open circuit spot. All right, we know the open circuit spot, the short, I'm sorry, not the open circuit, the short circuit spot, rather. The short circuit, we know, has a value of minus 1 plus J0. As we start here again with g is equal to 0 and uh, b is equal to, I'm sorry, g is equal to 2 and b is equal to 0. And we move this direction, what we'll find is our susceptance 
B becomes more and more positive, and as it approaches infinity, the contour then converges again back to the same point on the complex gamma plane, that point of a short circuit. Why? Because our admittance is approaching uh, 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 an infinite value, and as uh, the admittance goes to infinity, we know that is the definition of a short circuit. Admittance goes to infinity, the impedance goes to zero. And so both of these make sense, that the ends of our contours, as we can map them onto the complex gamma plane will converge to, in the case of constant uh, conductance, converge to the short circuit. In the case of constant resistance, both ends will converge to the uh, open circuit as the reactance value goes to infinity. So just a summary of what I just said, if I have a vertical contour on the complex admittance plane, uh, whose real part, every point has a real part equal to two, the imaginary part, the susceptance, can go upward to plus infinity or go downward to minus infinity. As it approaches those infinite susceptance, the magnitude of the admittance goes to a value of, uh, a value of infinity. Infinite admittance means uh, zero impedance. It is a short circuit and our points on that contour must map to the short circuit point on the complex gamma plane. Again, a value we know to be equal to minus one plus j zero or e to the j pi. So this rotation of our contours 180 degrees works for all of the contours that we have on our Smith chart. If we go through and we want to know what is the contour of a constant susceptance, a value where B is equal to one, a horizontal contour on the complex admittance plane, uh, we can simply go through and look for the contour on the Smith chart, which has a, where the impedance has a, an imaginary part of equal to one. Again, a horizontal contour on the complex impedance plane. So we find the normalized reactance equal to one contour, and it's here on the Smith chart. If I want to know the contour of uh, constant um, susceptance, B equal to one, if I want to know where that contour is on the Smith chart, I simply take this red contour and rotate all the points around. And if we do that, hopefully you see this is the result. This is the contour of constant um, susceptance now <clears throat> uh, on the Smith chart. And we can do that for any of the contours. Notice, and this is very important, that the contour of constant impedance, I'm sorry, reactance rather, of uh, x equal to 1 is in the upper half of our complex gamma plane. When we rotate it around now, this contour with an imaginary part of 1, a positive value of 1, it is in the bottom half of the complex gamma plane. So similarly, if I want to find a contour of the complex gamma plane of a uh, constant susceptance of minus one, again, it'd be a horizontal contour on the complex admittance plane that would be below the horizontal axis. Where is that mapped to on the complex gamma plane? Well, to do this, we very simply can find the value of contour, uh, the contour of constant reactance of minus one on the uh, on the Smith chart, x equal to minus one, the uh, um, reactance of minus one, and it sits in the lower half of the gamma plane. And then we rotate that whole contour around 180 degrees, and that gives us the contour of susceptance, which is equal to minus one. Every point on that contour corresponds to an emittance whose imaginary part is equal to minus one. Notice this contour will converge now to the short circuit case, and that occurs as the value uh, again of the uh, uh, admittance, I'm sorry, conductance goes, um, will go to infinity. So the imaginary part's equal to one. As the real part of the admittance goes to infinity, then the magnitude of the admittance will go to uh, infinity as well. Uh, infinite admittance is a short circuit. So we see a similar thing that's happening now for these contours of constant uh, conductance and constant admittance as what we saw for contours of constant resistance and constant reactance is that every contour will converge to an open circuit if I'm talking about impedance. In the case of admittance, every contour must converge to the short circuit point uh, on the complex gamma plane.
Now, there's a little bit of, again, uh, confusion that can occur here with re, uh, respect, uh, respect to signs. Uh, we find all the contours of constant susceptance uh, on the complex gamma plane will be in the lower half of the gamma plane. <clears throat> Since all of the contours of constant reactance of, uh, are in the upper half, uh, positive reactants are in the upper half, all of the contours of positive susceptance must be in the lower half as we rotate around 180 degrees. Conversely then, all the contours of, of negative reactants uh, are in the lower half of the complex gamma plane as we know, and as we rotate them around, they form the contours of constant negative, uh, contours of negative susceptance, which are then in the uh, upper half of the complex gamma plane. So again, some confusion here sometimes. X is positive in the upper half, but the value of B, susceptance, will be always negative. In the lower half, we know the reactance values will always be negative, um, which means the susceptance values will always be positive in that lower half. And so that gets into a question of, do we call the upper half and lower half of the complex gamma plane something different when we use admittance. For impedance, we said, oh, the upper half of the complex gamma plane is the inductive region, and the lower half is the capacitive region. And do we flip that if we're talking about admittance? And the answer is very definitely no. Remember that the a, um, uh, inductive impedance will have a reactance that's impositive, but an inductive, well, let me put it this way, an inductive device will have a reactance which is positive, but an inductive device will likewise have a susceptance which is negative. A capacitive device will have an impedance, a reactance rather, that is negative, where a capacitive device, the same capacitive device, will then have a susceptance which is positive. So inductance is positive reactance or negative susceptance, both say the same thing. They're both mapped to the upper part of the complex gamma plane where the inductive region lies. Also, a capacitive device has a negative reactance or a positive susceptance, and therefore the capacitive region, however we state it, is in the lower half of the complex gamma plane. So just to emphasize that point mathematically, uh, again, the normalized admittance is simply the inverse of the normalized impedance. And let's say the normalized impedance is purely reactive of some type. It could be positive or negative in terms of x. <clears throat> if we go through and take one over that, notice we get this result here. Because we have j uh, in our denominator, then we can rewrite it as minus j in our numerator. And so uh, when we do that, the same device uh, will have a susceptance, which is not only the inverse of the reactance, it's the inverse of the reactance times minus 1. So a reactance of plus 2 will, is equivalent to a susceptance of minus 0.5 for example. And that's why, again, an inductive device will have a positive reactance but a negative susceptance, and a capacitive device will have a negative reactance but a positive susceptance. And in either case, once again, the inductive region is the upper half of the, of the, of the complex gamma plane, the uh, capacitive region is the lower half. Again, that's why X is positive and B is negative in the upper half, and why B is positive and X is negative in the lower half of that complex gamma plane. So again, reiterating what I just said, the upper half of the complex gamma plane is unambiguously the inductive region, whether we um, state it in terms of positive reactance or negative susceptance. Likewise, the lower half is the capacitive region, uh, whether we express that in terms of positive susceptance or negative reactance. So if we take all the contours of the Smith chart, all the contours of constant R and constant X, and we rotate each and every one of them around the complex gamma plane, 180 degrees, rotate the entire thing, what we find is we get the contours of constant conductance and constant susceptance uh, on the complex gamma plane. We call that rotation of the contours the admittance Smith chart. And so one of the things we can do, and it's shown here, sometimes you'll see it this way, is on the complex gamma plane, simultaneously will be, plot, be plotted the contours of 
complex uh, you know, of uh, impedance and also the contours of complex uh, admittance. And they'll plot them on two different colors um, so you can kind of keep track of them. And again, for a given point on the complex gamma plane, therefore, you can simultaneously determine the value of that reflection coefficient, both its uh, expression in terms of admittance and its expression in terms of impedance. But of course, when you look at this, it gets a little bit busy and confusing. So because those uh, the simultaneously put Plot blow, simultaneously plot both uh, contours on the uh, complex gamma plane. Since that's so uh, confusing, perhaps you might ask yourselves, do they uh, provide, is there anyone who publishes an admittance Smith chart by itself with only admittance contours? And so we can buy our impedance Smith chart or our admittance Smith chart. Well, it turns out not only do uh, or, do, or is uh, admittance Smith charts uh, published, uh, really that's, uh, that's the only Smith chart that is published because what we'll find is a Smith chart is neither an admittance Smith chart or an impedance Smith chart. It is simultaneously both Smith charts. And if you look at a lot of Smith charts right about here, it'll say something like the resistive component or the conductive, conductance component rather. Uh, it'll say for other contours, the reactive component or the susceptive component, meaning it can be interpreted either way. One Smith chart can be either an admittance Smith chart or an impedance Smith chart. So this seems to make even things more confusing. And I say that uh, you know the contours are either uh, um, impedance or admittance, they're resistance or conductance. How could they simultaneously be uh, one thing or the other? Well, it turns out it all depends on how you look at it. And that's very literal. What happens in a Smith chart is we can do something to it to turn our contours into contours of admittance only, and then do something else to turn it into unambiguously contours of impedance only. And let's see what that is. So let's look begin by looking at the impedance Smith chart that we uh, uh, know so much about now. And um, again, it's on the complex gamma plane. And we know it is the impedance Smith chart because our contours all of them converge to the same point over here, a value of gamma 1 plus j0, a value of gamma is equal to 1 e the j0, however we want to talk about it. It is the open circuit, and every contour will converge to that open circuit point, and so recognize these contours immediately to be contours of constant reactance and constant resistance. All right, now we want to do something to our Smith chart, which will change these contours from contours of constant impedance to contours of constant uh, admittance. So here's what we do. Uh, very physically, you take your Smith chart, it's written on a piece of paper, and you rotate it around 180 degrees. And we do that, then all of the contours that we had uh, for constant uh, impedance will rotate around and now become contours of constant admittance. Notice only the contours, though, effectively are rotated. Now, I know physically it looks like everything's being rotated, but in your mind you need to realize you're only rotating the contours. The complex gamma plane is the same as it was before. Here's the imaginary axis. Here's the real axis. This is the location of the open circuit as before, and therefore this is the location of the short circuit as before. And we can then confirm that these contours are contours of constant conductance and constant susceptance, and that every one of those contours converge to this point on the Smith chart, a point which is equal to gamma equal to minus 1 plus j0, a point which is e to the j pi, the short circuit, the location where the admittance goes to infinity uh, um, uh, for every point, uh, all the contours uh, of conductance and susceptance plotted onto the um, complex gamma plane. One more thing that's interesting and want to keep in mind here is these are, of course, the contours of the constant imaginary part of admittance, in other words, constant susceptance. These values now, of course, have uh, uh, numeric values that are negative if they are in the upper half of the 
of the um, uh, uh, compl of the complex gamma plane, and these contours of constant susceptance, constant B, they are now <clears throat> positive. Um, um, even though uh, in the lower half of the complex gamma plane. This change between what's positive and negative is why the, con uh, or sorry, the numeric indexes that define these contour, uh, contours of uh, constant imaginary portion reactants are susceptance. That's why they don't have a sign. We talked about this that uh, when I looked at constant um, contours of constant reactants um, that um, the upper half is positive and they're labeled as so, but on the lower half of the Smith chart, those contours are negative, but they are not labeled as such. You have to recognize they're in the lower half and therefore have a, 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 a reactance that is negative. And so that's why they weren't labeled as positive or negative because the anticipation was that you might rotate the Smith chart and use it as an admittance Smith chart. And in that case, these contours would be negative and and these contours down here now would be positive. So you just have to keep that in mind as you look at the Smith chart. Again, sometimes it's confusing when you look at a Smith chart to think now, is this emittance or is this, is this um, impedance of Smith chart? And uh, the way you tell the difference is, are the contours converging to the uh, left half of the left point of the Smith chart at uh, the point of uh, short circuit, or are they converging to the open circuit point uh, located here. So I want to emphasize once again the most important thing about this uh, simple transformation where we take our Smith chart and we rotate it around 180 degrees. We're rotating all the contours around, changing the contours of constant impedance into contours of uh, constant impedance into contour, contours of constant emittance. But the Smith chart itself, I'm sorry, the complex gamma plane rather itself does not rotate. I know physically it actually does, but mathematically in your mind, you need to make sure that what you are doing is only rotating the contours, that the geography of the complex gamma plane remains the same. And specifically, when the open circuit is all the way over on the right side of the Smith chart, before you do the rotation, it still is over on the right side of the Smith chart after you do the rotation because the complex gamma plane itself has not changed. The Smith chart was over on the left, the left side of the, of the uh, Smith chart before the rotation. If you rotate around 180 degrees when you're done, even though the contours have rotated, you must keep in mind that the Smith chart is still over on the left side of the, uh, of the Smith chart. The contours rotate, but the complex gamma plane remains constant as we rotate those contours. So graphically, hopefully this will sort of make this clear. On the left side here, we have the admittance Smith chart, and we have the contours of resistance and reactance that all converge to the open circuit. The Smith chart is over here, I'm sorry, the short circuit rather, is over here on the left side of the Smith chart. What about the uh, admittance Smith chart? Well, we rotate the contours around, and so all of a sudden these little R circles get rotated around 180 degrees, and we have the little circles here at this point. Notice now all the contours are converging to the short circuit. The short circuit point over here on the left side is exactly the same point as the short circuit for the impedance Smith chart. The open circuit here, the value of gamma is equal to 1 plus J0, is still the open circuit on the admittance the Smith chart. Again, what we're doing, again on a piece of paper, it's we have to rotate them the, the same, but mentally, as you rotate your contours, make sure you understand you're not uh, rotating your complex gamma plane, that your short circuit in either case and your open circuit in either case remains the same. The imaginary axis is the same as it was before and after the rotation of the contours. The uh, real axis is the same before and after the rotation of those contours.